Hey, Tim Frisch with a Frisch Perspective. So the NASB 2020 has finally come out. A lot of people have been waiting for it and have been excited about it. Other people apprehensive about it. But what I wanted to do in this video is give a comparison and analysis because a lot of people are curious. How does the 2020 compare to the NASB 1995 edition? The 95 edition is very, very much loved by many people. There are a lot of people that are really gung-ho about the 95 NESB. And so there's been mixed reactions to having an update of that edition. I just want to show you some examples in this presentation. It's not going to be super exhaustive. So you're not going to see all the changes. I wouldn't have time, and I don't even know all of the changes. But I wanted to give you a sense of the changes uh, that have been made in the 2020 update. You get a sense right off the bat when you look at the forward that there are a lot of similarities when you see these two forwards together. On the left is the NASB 1995 edition and on the right is the 2020. So when I have the two Bibles together I always put the 95 on the left and the 2020 on the right. And you can see that there's a lot of similarities here. When you get to the next page here on the left we have alternative readings that's also here in the 2020 alternative readings however there are some added sections in between here and so if you go back and you look here in the 2020 edition it talks about gender accuracy and they've updated language in certain places now they're not talking about gender inclusiveness they're just talking about words that traditionally people would have known referred to men and women when they said man or men now especially in this plural they're they're going to translate it as people and uh, the reason they do that is just to clarify that the original text wasn't necessarily just referring to only men it was also referring to women too so that's what they're talking about there gender accuracy the word brethren has been updated uh, to a more modern word brothers is is what we would say today rather than brethren and they actually do translate it in certain cases as brothers and sisters. So it talks about that in the word let's for action. And then also over here, uh, names in the New Testament, it talks about how certain names have been updated, such as Zacharias, uh, are usually given in their original Hebrew forms as in Zechariah, for Zacharias. Uh, so that would be one, although they do say that well-known names are kept the same. So some changes there that you can see in the preface, that gives you a little taste. But overall, a lot of similarities when you look at these two together. So it is an update, but it's not like this is a totally different translation. There are a lot of similarities too. But let's talk about the changes from the 95 to the 2020. Now these are ones that I've noted this is not super scientific, but it gives you an idea of the kinds of changes that you will see. You'll see updated language. You'll see some changes in number formatting. You'll see some of those New Testament names changed, some smoothing out of the wording, uh, some translation updates, and also how they handle the critical text or the textus receptus versus the critical text. So we'll look at that too. So let's look at updating the language and as was noted in the preface, uh, gender accuracy is something they uh, address in this update. And so if you look here in Proverbs, just as one example, you'll see here in the 95 edition, they use the word man quite a bit. Better is a poor man. But on the right here in the 2020, it talks about a poor person, a person of too many friends. And here, chapter 19, verse 1, a poor person. It's interesting though, right here they actually do in the older edition use the word person uh, and they kept it here in the new edition. So even the older edition did have some gender accuracy, inclusiveness, however you want to term that, but the new one is more consistent in how they word those things. So the gender language, uh, also the word brethren, it talks about that in the preface. And here you see in 1 Corinthians 15, Verse 1, I make known to you, brethren, has been updated to I make known to you, brothers. And they add in italics and sisters. And the reason they put that in italics is because the word in the Greek is the word masculine, brothers. 
but it is implied that it's not just referring to men, it's also referring to women in the church. And so they put the phrase there in sisters. So that's an interesting way and a good way to deal with it, really, because it really gives the sense of what Paul is saying, but you can see what the Greek term is, that it's a masculine term. So if you're going to update it, I think that's a really good way to do it. So that's with the word brethren. And then just some other phrases here that I've noticed is thus says the Lord and Lord of hosts. If you're more of a traditionalist, you might like these phrases, but they're trying to render the language in contemporary English. So you see here in Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 18, it says, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts in the 95 edition but in the newer edition it says therefore this is what the lord of armies the god of israel says so one of the differences that you'll see is the term lord of hosts that phrase is now lord of armies because i i would assume a lot of people today may not know what hosts is even referring to so they clarify that with the word armies but also even maybe more significantly is instead of saying thus says the lord it says, this is what the Lord says in a lot of places now. So that's less traditional wording, but we don't usually today say, thus says so-and-so. We say, so-and-so says, and so they've just updated that English there. So those are some differences, and also the word let's, they talked about that actually in the preface. And that's because in modern English, we don't usually say this. You'll see in Matthew 26, 46, get up. Jesus is saying, let us be going. Now it says, get up, let's go. And uh, this newer edition does read a lot more like the way we speak. They actually give an explanation of this, by the way, in the preface. It talks about how in the original language, there is no helping verb such as let. So it, it says it's common today for readers to understand let us to mean allow us. So in effect, let us has become unintentionally misleading to most readers. Therefore, the simple contraction let's has emerged as the clearest expression because this form reflects the nuance of meaning in the original language. So whether you agree with that or not, that's basically what they felt they should go with. But interestingly, it says in some situations, let us is retained for intimate discourse within the Godhead, as in Genesis 1.26, which does still say, let us make mankind in our image. So they didn't change every instance of that term, let us. Another difference is in number formatting. So I don't have a lot to show you here, but just to give you an example, the number formatting in the 95 edition has all of the numeric notation here on the left. Here you'll notice, though, that it has it sometimes, but not all the time. And I wasn't sure at first what was going on there. Why do they sometimes just write it out? And the reason, I think, is because on the left here, when they have an even thousand number, notice there's no, nothing in the hundreds place, whereas you do have hundreds in these numbers, then they just write it out with the words. And uh, so over here on the left, you see the measurements there, and these are even thousands. So you see here in the 2020, they just wrote that out with words because they're even thousands. So that's just a stylistic thing, I think. I think it's just their way of, you know, making it look better rather than having numeric notation all over the place. Another change is some of the New Testament names. Again, not a lot to show here. I could only find really one difference and it was that that name Zacharias. Here it's Zacharias in the 95 and now it's been changed to Zachariah. If you find other changes of names in the New Testament, leave that in the comments below. But that's the only one that I could find. Another change is the smoothing out of the language. One example here is where it says, Now having been questioned by the Pharisees, now it reads, Now he was questioned by the Pharisees. And this newer edition puts it in a way much more the way that we would say things today. In the book of John here, chapter 9, verse 18, it says, The Jews then did not believe it of him. The newer edition says the Jews then did not believe it about him. So that phrase that it used to have there, did not believe it of him, that's just not something anybody would say, I didn't believe it of him. But we might say something like, I didn't believe it about him. That's a little bit more the way we would say it, although that's still a bit of a wooden translation in my opinion, but I think that's definitely an improvement. 
So it's a smoother translation, and then also they did make some translation choices and changes here. So for example, in 1 Corinthians 7, 2, Paul says, but because of immoralities, so that was a single word in the Greek, but immoralities is, is a very generic term. What's it really referring to? So they clarify that in the new edition, but because of sexual immoralities, because the word pernea is referring to immorality of a sexual nature. In 1 Corinthians 7.36, it says, If any man thinks he is acting unbecomingly toward his virgin daughter, and notice they added in the 95 edition the italicized word daughter. Now in the 2020, it says, If anyone thinks he is acting dishonorably toward his virgin, and there is no word daughter there, if she is past her youth and it ought to be so, let him do what he wishes. He is not sinning, let them marry. Before it said, let her marry. But in the footnote, it said literally them. So this is actually more literal. The, the, the newer edition is more literal in this instance. The older edition was implying that this actually has to do with a father and a daughter. But in this case, it's, it's showing that it's really referring more to a woman and her betrothed, her husband-to-be. So some translation changes there. And then also how they handle the critical text versus the textus receptus. And you can see here in Matthew chapter 6 in the Lord's Prayer, in the older edition, you could see they kept the ending of that prayer tra that's traditionally there in the Textus Receptus in brackets. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In the newer edition, uh, they don't actually have that phrase there. But they do put it in the footnote here. Late manuscripts add for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So that's a case where they actually, in the older edition, did have the Textus Receptus reading in the text, but in the newer edition they took it out. The ending of Mark in the 1995 edition, they do have the longer ending here, 9 through verse 20, but they put it in brackets there, and then they actually have another ending here, uh, but it's in italics with brackets around it. The newer edition has, again, the longer ending 9 through 20 in the text, but now it's in double brackets. And again, they have that other ending of Mark in italics, and it's in double brackets. So actually, they really handled that pretty much the same way. Another example here is Luke 23, verse 17. It does have in single brackets here in the 95 edition, he was obliged to release to them at the feast one prisoner and you'll see it's actually the same pretty much in the newer edition now he was obligated to release to them at the feast one prisoner so they kept that verse in both editions John chapter 5 the end of verse 3 through verse 4 in the 95 edition was in brackets in the text in the newer edition they actually took the end of verse 3 and verse 4 from the Textus Receptus out of there, but they do have it in the footnote here. John 7, 53 through the beginning of chapter 8. In the 95 edition, they have brackets here, but it is in the text. And you'll see in the newer edition, it's in double brackets, but it is still in the text. And they do actually have a footnote here. Later manuscripts add the story of the adulterous woman, numbering it as John 7, 53 through 8, 11. The older edition said really the same thing. So that one was handled pretty much the same way. If you look here concerning the bracketing, the older edition says in text brackets indicate words probably not in the original writings. In the newer edition it says in text double brackets indicate words very likely not in the original manuscripts. And then single brackets in text brackets indicate words probably not in the original manuscripts. So they made a delineation now between phrases and verses that are either probably not in the text, and if they're in double brackets, they're very likely not in the text. Now this is according to their scholarship. Not everybody agrees with this, but this is uh, basically how they've dealt with the critical text versus the Textus Receptus in this edition. Now with all of those changes, it does need to be said that there's actually a lot of things that are not changed from the 95 to the 2020 edition. The theology hasn't changed, the italics for supplied words in English, capitalized pronouns for deity, 
capitalized words for Old Testament quotes in the New Testament, and asterisks for Greek tense are a lot of the things that you'll still see the same. But to show you first of all here concerning doctrine and theology, in James chapter 3 verse 1, the 95 said, Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that such as such we will incur a stricter judgment. The newer edition says, Do not become teachers in large numbers, my brothers, since you know that we who are teachers will incur a stricter judgment. So it does read more smoothly in the newer edition, but also notice what is not changed is uh, this is still a masculine term referring to teachers. So James here is referring to men is what they're saying, and that's why they just translate it as brothers. They do not add in sisters in italics. So that gives you an example where the theology doctrine has not changed. Another example, people were wondering about 1 Peter 2.24. What are they going to do with the word cross? In the 95, they use the word cross. And in the newer edition, you'll see they still use the word cross. The wording of the verse has changed some. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. Now reads, and he himself brought our sins in his body up on the cross. The footnote for that says that it, it's offered up. And then literally the word for cross is wood. So they changed the wording a little bit, but ultimately they did use the word cross for the word wood there. So for those of you who are wondering, they did not make a really big change there. So I think the theology doctrine really in both of these Bibles is the same. Again, you're still going to have italics for supplied words. You can see that in many places if you look on this page where there are italics for words that aren't directly in the Greek language here but they are implied by the Greek and it makes more sense if you put those words there in English. Capitalized pronouns for deity. Not all Bibles have this, but for example in the New Testament when you have a pronoun referring to Jesus, they will capitalize that pronoun. It does show respect, but it's also helpful so you know who's being referred to when you see that pronoun. On the other hand, the original language didn't have capitalizations, particularly for pronouns uh, for deity. So it is interpretive, so people have different opinions about that. But they kept those capitalized pronouns for deity. They also have capitalized words for Old Testament quotes in the New Testament. Actually, small caps is how they refer to these. And so you can see here a quote from the Old Testament in all capital letters, and also over here a quote from the Old Testament. So that's just like the previous editions. Also asterisks for Greek tense. So in Greek, this would actually be more of a present tense. The slaves said to him is how they translated that, just to keep it consistent with how the other wording is. Uh, we actually do this in English sometimes. People will say, well, he says to me, even though they're talking about the past. Well, that happened in Greek too, but that's not really correct English, so they put that in past tense. And they put an asterisk there to denote the tense. So my final thoughts on this, and I'm just giving my own opinion here. Not everybody would agree. But uh, first of all, I want to point out that NESB has been modernized before. So I think people make a big deal out of them making changes. But remember, the early editions of the NASB had these and thous in prayers for God and when there was a direct address to deity. Now... In, even in the 95 edition, they use the word you, yours. And so really that's a big change because using thee and thou is something people traditionally did as a sign of respect. Taking that out modernized it, but it's much more the way that we talk and even pray today. Another thing is that it is trying to be literal, but it's also trying to be contemporary. And that's a really difficult balance. But if you look actually here at both prefaces, you'll see modern English usage. The attempt has been made to render the grammar and terminology in contemporary English when it was felt that the word-for-word -word literalness was unacceptable to the modern reader, a change was made in the direction of a more current English idiom. So that's what they said in 95, and really that's what they're doing here in this update. They want to put things in contemporary English. That's very challenging when you're also still trying to be literal in your renderings. And that's why the NASB is, is really unique. Some people really like it. I find it to be a mixed bag. Sometimes it is a little bit 
almost too literal in the way they render things. It doesn't quite sound the way that we would talk, and yet it does read in a very modern way. And that modernization is actually very helpful. A lot of people say they really like the NASB because for some reason they can really understand it, and I think it's because they do a good job of, of modernizing. Other translations like the, the ESV and the NKJV, it's harder for some people to understand because they kept the word order in ways that are more traditional and not the way we would say things in contemporary English. So it's a tough balance, but that's what they're trying to do. I personally think when I look at this 2020 update that it has actually stayed true to its original intent. If you look at the fourfold aim of the Lockman Foundation, they want a publication that will be uh, true to the original Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, grammatically correct, understandable, and give the Lord Jesus Christ his proper place. So particularly in those areas of being grammatically correct and understandable, this edition is really, I think, doing a good job with those aims. So that was my presentation to give you an understanding of some of the changes that have been made from the NASB 95 to the 2020 and provide a little bit of analysis and opinion about it. If you have questions or comments about what I've talked about in this video, feel free to leave those in the comments section below. But thank you as always for watching this video and listening to what I have to say from a fresh perspective.